is your relationship with time? Are you wired and tired, stressed and overwhelmed, busy and going nowhere, or just want to scale your business? Welcome to Take Back Time with your host, Penny Zenker. Penny focuses on books, strategies, tools, and tips to help you work smarter and approach your time more strategically. As a result, you can have more energy, focus, and get more done in less time. Be more efficient and effective. Get ready to take back time. Hello, and welcome to Take Back Time. My name is Penny Zanker. And as you know, I'm the host of this show, and we are looking to find great people, people who are going to get you to think differently, people who are going to challenge you to get out of your funk, to get out of your autopilot, and to think smarter so that you can work smarter. And I know we're going to have a great conversation today. Andrew Hartman is here with me today, and he's the founder of Time Boss, an organization that helps leaders and their teams to reinvent their relationship with time to get more done with less stress and anxiety. We like that. Andrew founded Time Boss after burning out several times over, so many times, and even losing his sense of smell for a season. And he's taken all that he's learned over the years to build a system to help business leaders and their teams to avoid the same mistakes and avoid the chaos. He is a fractional COO with 18 plus years of experience supporting the launch of software and technology startups. Well, we do have a lot in common, Andrew. Welcome to the Mm. show. Thank you so much, Penny. I'm so glad to be here. So you lost your sense of smell. Like that wasn't, you didn't have COVID, right? Are you, no. you know? <laughs> this is the mid 2000s, well, well before COVID. But yeah, lost my sense of smell. I was on a grind for a long time, uh, working long hours, sleeping terribly, lost in stress, fear, and anxiety. And could have told you it was coming, just kind of hot flashes, just was so overwhelmed by the work that was in front of me. One day woke up, didn't smell anything, and that lasted for six months. The body will do weird things when you're stressed out. Yeah, that's crazy, right? That's just part of what happens is that you start to shut down, right? That you couldn't sleep. Hot flashes. Wow, that's interesting. I get them for another reason, but (laughs) that's, you know, it's, I read somewhere that stress is stored in our cells, right? So that's why these things happen is it just shuts down and builds up. And your body will do very interesting things to get your attention. You know, if we held our breath here for the next three or four minutes, we would pass out so that our body would be like, all right, dummy, I'm taking over. We're going to start breathing again. And for me, it was my body saying like, listen, dummy, you can't not sleep. Like you got to take care of yourself. You got to work out. You got to do these things. And I just was, I was grinding so hard for Mm. these things that I really cared about. I really wanted to contribute. I wanted to do well. And I just was doing it in a way that was absolutely unsustainable that was driving me and my teams into the ground. Right. What keeps us in that place? Like you were there, you probably, like you said, you could, you probably could have seen it coming. Why are we not noticing and doing anything about it? Because this is a common thing now, right? 60 plus percent of people are experiencing burnout symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. I've read numbers that are even higher. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah. You know, I think what it is, Penny, is I grew up in a great family. Mom and dad that loved me had great bosses coming out of school. Nobody taught me how to manage time. No Mm. one taught me what to do when I had more to do than I had time to do it. And so I think we have some hardwired things in us that when we hit stress, we just start shoveling faster. We just try to get out of it. And what's challenging there is I think anxiety becomes this drug that just feeds us. You know, if my house is on fire right now and I put out that fire, I'm going to feel pretty good about myself. And I think metaphorically, we feel like our house is constantly on fire. And so we just point ourselves to the hottest fire. And as soon as we put it out, we get a little dopamine hit and we look to the right and there's another fire. And we look to the right and there's another fire. I got this. Yeah. And we feel like heroes and nobody, we got strokes our entire life. We got out of boys and out of girls our entire life for putting out fires, for hustling, for getting after it, you know, all these things that had nothing to say to what to do when there's more things to do than we have time to do it. And that is the experience of the modern knowledge worker. There is no widget. There is no manufacturing floor for a knowledge worker. They don't get a clock out at 5 p.m. and leave the machine at the office and go home and they couldn't even do work if they wanted to. We live in a world where we could work all the time and there will always be more to do. We can always make our products better. We can always Mm -hmm. make our companies better. 
We can always be a better parent, whatever these things are that we want to contribute to. And if you don't have a way to think about that, it's just going to be overwhelming. You're going to get people lost. Care. Yeah. You said, I think this was before we actually started, you care deeply, right? And I think- Deeply. Especially for those people who care deeply is they know that there's better. So they have to keep, they, they don't know how to deal with that and shut down. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that that's what it was for me. You know, at, at points I would care- at a really high level about the contribution or whatever the company was I was working for, I cared deeply about its impact. At other points, I just cared about the person next to me and I kept going because I wanted them to keep going. Yeah. You know? But either way, if you don't have a way to think about that work, if you don't have a way to pause, I know in your world, you use this idea of a reset moment. If you don't have reset moments where you are evaluating all the things coming at you and have ways to think about it to really set up your future self to be successful, you're just going to get overwhelmed. Yeah, absolutely. So you use my language. Thank you. I feel like if we give something language, right, right, then it creates a heightened awareness for it. So how would you say people go about taking these reset moments or what does it mean to you based on right. your 18 plus years of experience with this? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, so let's maybe start with the opposite of how most people operate. Most people operate real time and they are just carrying this kind of two week sonic boom of tasks and expectations and calendar events. And maybe I should. And what if I did that? Or, oh, I forgot to do that. Like they just have this cacophony of things going on in their head that they're carrying through life. That's their typical experience. And so if you ask them that they could do something, they're like, oh, I probably can't get to it for a couple of weeks because they just feel like they're drowning, but they assume in a couple of weeks, they'll probably be able to figure it out. <laughs> what they're doing is they're constantly punting to their future self to figure it out. And they're not planning. They're not having a reset moment truly to pause and reflect and plan and consider their future self and what their future self might need. And so their future self is just showing up and hoping for the best. And it's just kind of the same song, set, different verse tomorrow well, they're, they're the day after. Yeah, they're bogging their future self down because, yeah, they're just keep loading things on. Is, right. right. The way I encourage people to think about this is imagine if you have an employee that you really care about. You're not just going to punt to that person and hope they figure it out. You're going to give them really clear expectations <laughs> and you're going to make sure that their work is right sized and you're going to give them a clear definition of done. This is what we're driving towards. And you're going to give them permission to protect their time, to ignore things that are non-priority. You're literally going to set that person up to be successful. It's only rational. It's this employee is on your payroll or on your company's payroll, and you want to make a good use of their investment. It's only rational for you to do that. We'll do that all day long for an employee on our team. We won't do that for ourselves. And so that's where the language of time boss comes from. It's you are the boss of your future self as a knowledge worker. You are setting up your future self to be successful in the same way you would set up an employee on your team. And a lot of the habits that we do in delegation, are we're really just delegating to our future self. And so reset moments in my world, one of the things that we use, a key habit is a weekly planning meeting. It's very simple. And it's just doing the work to get clear on all the work to be done, right-sizing it to the capacity of your future self, what they can actually get done next week, making sure they have a realistic plan dealing with all the things that don't fit, which is where we typically go sideways. We make a plan and then we look at all these things that didn't fit in the plan. And we're like, well, we'll just hope for the best. Maybe we'll get to them. And we end up drowning in stress and anxiety in that process. And then we just don't commit. So in my mind, you know, that's to use your language, that is a reset moment. It's that purposeful pause where I am considering the needs of my future self. And then I'm giving them a plan that they can actually make happen over the next seven days. It's incredibly powerful when people wrap their head around that habit. Absolutely. So, well, first I want to go back and say it would be nice if managers and leaders had the time and took the time to make sure that they right-sized things and they made expectations clear and all of that for their staff. They want to, but they also feel like they don't have time to do that. So we're <laughs> seeing a lot of that, right? Is right. a recent study I saw 60% of people don't feel like they have clear direction. And so- whether it's for someone else or yourself, I love the idea of what you're saying is that we do tend to do more and be more caring for others than we are for ourselves. So I love that you're saying that we need to do it for our team, but we also need to do it for ourselves. So I love that. And you've got this weekly planning meeting that we'd have right. for ourselves to make sure that we're doing the right things we need to do now and how to, so how do you deal with those things that aren't a right fit? Like, so when you say there's these things that 
we're going to right size it. Maybe you've got some strategies. How do we determine what we do and what we don't do or what we push off or what right. do we do with those other things? Well, it's funny. It's at the end of the day, it's really math. So if you think about it, again, most people have a pretty emotional relationship with the work they have to do or their expectations of the work they have to do. And mm -hmm. so the first thing I encourage people to do is just get it to a list. This is classic. If you've ever read getting things done, this is classic getting things done, get it out of your head, get it into the system. Mm -hmm. And once we do that and we can see it all, you can just see all the things that are going to compete. You know, if I choose next week that I'm going to work 40 hours or 60 hours or, or however long I choose to work that I'm willing to give to this area of my life, then everything that happens within that time is going to compete. So my first recommendation for people is to get it out of their head, get it onto a list. Once it's on a list, that's when you do the prioritization. And again, this is where most people punt at their future self. They don't like thinking about the trade-offs, so they just punt their future self to figure it out. And the reality is your future self is going to figure it out. At 8 a.m. on Monday, when you show up to work, you're going to do something. And so you're either going to reveal the actual priority or at least your perception of the priority when you show up at 8 a.m. Or my strong suggestion to people, again, doing work on behalf of their future self is to do the work in that weekly meeting to feel the trade-offs, to feel the priorities, and literally just stack rank those items in order. What order should I do these in? What is their actual priority? And then I think once you do that- well, Let's stay there for a minute. Sure. What's the criteria? How do I do that? Like, you know, that's easier said than done, right? Right. I, I see my list and everything on that list is a priority. This is what, right. I'm sure you hear this too. This is what people say. 100%. So you either have to know you either have to have a rubric for a prioritization or you just have to make one up, truly. So for people that don't feel like they have clear direction, that 60% that you were talking about, you may need to just do your best guess of how do I move this business forward? Let's assume we're focused on some type of income generating opportunity for the entrepreneur or works at a business, whatever. Okay, let's say service business. Service business. And let's say you know, like, well, I hear my boss talking about the sales numbers a lot. Okay, so... I'm going to take a look at this, this list of items and I'm going to say, what is going to enable sales at a higher level? And you can do a number of things there. One, it could just be your gut, like stack rank one versus two. I think this one's going to have a higher enablement on sales. Two, you can run an easy framework, like something like ICE, where ICE is, if you Google it, it's a really simple framework to use. It's a ranking system where you're looking at the hypothesized impact of the item. Uh, hard is it to do the work? How much time is it going to take for me to do the thing? And how likely do I think it'll actually have the impact if I'm successful? It's a very simple way to prioritize. Right. And again, you can simply apply it. If you have clarity, like if you have a boss that's actually said, this is how we're going to win together. Maybe you're running something like EOS or Pinnacle or Scaling Up or something where you have like a clear rock or a clear quarterly goal that you're driving towards. Then again, I'm suggesting people feel empowered as a professional to say, how do the items that are on my list contribute to these larger goals? Which is going to have the greatest impact over the next seven days and rank accordingly. Absolutely. I just want to make sure that included in that reset moment is getting connected with that higher objective, right? Yep. Is that everything has to relate to the higher objective? Because I think Correct. where people sometimes get amiss, and I love your feedback on this, is they focus on the work and the tasks versus the objective. And right. that's where it becomes too much because they're not focused on the objective. And so they're doing all these other things that are unnecessary or just don't lead anywhere. So yeah. if focused on adding more tasks and working, you're just going to be busy versus focusing on the objective to help you to complete and reach your yeah. objective. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. The, where people get tripped up is the experience of life is this moment. You know, right now, our only job is to have a really meaningful conversation with each other. That's our only job. It'd be really inappropriate for me to pull up my phone, start checking it, for me to start replying to emails here on my computer in front of me or something. Like it's our job to be present. And so if fundamentally we believe if we just do one thing at a time, we'll have the highest impact of success. People are like, yeah, I get that. I'm just doing this task. I'm just making this task happen. But to your point, you have to be able to oscillate between the high level goal and the discrete task here that's going to help me move it forward. And so yeah, I think, you know, whether that's going in the description of a task in your task management system and literally typing in the value or somehow flagging it to the higher level goal it's connected to, you want to maintain that context. But when it comes time to make the thing happen, you want to just be so clearly defined on what is the definition yeah. of this done and this task for me to drive it to completion. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that makes sense to me, right? Is then when you're clear, just do the thing, right? Just do and the thing. Yep. Block everything out. 
how do you do that? Like, you know, there's a yeah. lot of distractions today. Like, do you have some tips on how yeah, people can block some of those distractions out? Absolutely. So, I, you know, finishing that weekly planning process, once you get clear on your priorities, your job is to manufacture those down to what I just call discrete tasks. You hear me use that language. And it's really just what are the one to four hour tasks that will help me drive whatever this thing is, right? And so if my goal is to hire a sales director, because I'm trying to advance some sales goal I'm trying to drive, then the first discrete task under hire a sales director might be write a job description. And the secondary discrete task might be get feedback on the job description from my team or something. And so what you're trying to do is to try to really, really get clear and break, do the work to break it down where those discrete tasks then become items that you block on your calendar for when that thing comes up. At 8 a.m., when it comes up and says, write the job description, that's my job. Like I've literally been the boss of my future self to make that thing happen. Now, a lot of people calendar block. They block off their calendar for tasks. Where most people go sideways is they dramatically overschedule themselves. They schedule every minute of the day because yeah. it feels good. It feels like I'm in control. And my yeah. strong suggestion to people when they're getting started is only block 60% of your day which means you're leaving 40% of your day available. And I call that 40% time whirlwind. And here's what's really interesting about that, Penny, is mm -hmm. when you give yourself realistic buffer, you are much more likely to stay committed to the items you put on your calendar because you know you will have time later on in the day to handle those additional items. Mm -hmm. And so we become better at redirecting people into that whirlwind time. We become better at negotiating, hey, Definitely hear that request. I'd love to help you. Could I help you out at 2 p.m. this afternoon? Yeah, no problem. Let's do that. And certainly every once in a while, a client's going to call and it's on fire. Your boss is going to call it's on fire and you need to drop whatever you're doing and do it. But if you've planned that buffer, let's say at 8 a.m. I sat down to write the job description and my number one client calls and their website is down and I need to solve it right now or who knows what the issue is. I can literally just take that task I planned for 8 a.m., slide it into my whirlwind. I have buffer ready. And it allows me to contend with reality. And I think when you have a realistic plan, you are so much more likely to commit to that plan. Well, I like what you're saying, because it's almost like your plan is to not plan. And there's a certain portion that's left open, which is, I used to say, plan some of your reactive time. So leaving right. that buffer space, like you're saying. So if we overbook ourselves, then we're not in control. We actually are creating the issue that we're trying to avoid, right? You're which is being right. out of control. So that makes total sense. And okay, so how did you come up with like 40%? Is that it, like it's just from a, experience? And, it's and just, just from experience, yeah. So the way that I recommend is the more control you have on your time, the less whirlwind time you need. So you have some people, so solopreneurs who maybe they're running a content-based business or a client-based business or a software-based business where they don't have anyone reaching out. They have a ton of control of their time. They don't need 60%. They don't gotcha. need 40% whirlwind, I should say. If you're a customer support agent where your job is to be available, you actually have no strategic time. Your strategic time is being available. And right. so you shouldn't even plan for it. So it's really finding the right mix. And what's powerful when you look at your relationship with time as a set of habits, and truly to use your language, where each week I have a reset moment or a weekly planning meeting where I'm reflecting on this past week, I'm making tiny adjustments, and then I'm planning again for next week. I can find the right amount of whirlwind time to program into my week. So for me personally, I minus 20% time. It's not 40%. And I found that that's what I need. That's truly my highest sustainable pace. That's the fastest that I can go without stress, fear, and anxiety being a whip at my heels, but peace and freedom and connectedness being what's driving me to contribute to things that I care about. But I have to keep that 20% buffer or it doesn't happen. I start feeling that franticness. I start feeling like that, oh, I just got to stay ahead. And I don't want that. I don't actually think that's helpful. It doesn't help me make the greatest impact I can make. Right. Sure. Because it it then starts to create anxiety and whatnot. It's an interesting exactly. concept because I don't look at it like that. But I think because like I have a little bit much going on myself right now and I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, trying to look at my first thing is to step back and see where can I decommit. So like if it's not important for this week, yes, maybe I can put it into my future self, but in a way that because I know what my deliverables are this week and right. or how can I batch it more right. effectively. But if I think about it, I like that idea. I think I need more time, especially what that made me think of when you were, it depends on what you're trying to do. So I need more creative time. So I need more flexibility in my time so that if something takes longer, I can let it 
go yeah. long. So I think right now, I think that 40% would be good for me. In a way that I might encourage you to think about it, Penny, what's so Time Boss is not for people in a low gear. It's for people that want to contribute. It's for people that are up to something, but they want to do it with peace and freedom and connectedness. And yeah. what happens then where Whirlwind is not like my get out of jail free card, Whirlwind is my way to deal with reality. But what's so powerful is if I hit Whirlwind and I don't need it, let's say there's not things that have taken over my day or I've top of my email box or whatever <laughs> I'm going to use Whirlwind time for. I can look, reach into whatever I schedule for tomorrow and pull it into today and start working on it. Yeah. And then I start telling myself a magical story about my priorities. And it's that I'm ahead and I'm not behind. And most people's functional experience of life is they're behind schedule and they're late. Right. And it, you bring a totally different self. You talked about creative work. You bring a totally different self to creative work when you have the emotional space to be fully present to that task. Yeah. And so to me, it's the pain is the weekly planning meeting when we map to reality and we feel all the weight of things that don't fit, right? That's when we feel the trade-offs. It's an, a kind of an emotional experience. But if we can do the work to take care of those things, whether we're deferring them or delegating them or digitizing them, maybe if they're not that important, we just delete them. If we can do that work and we can right-size our expectations to what's actually possible next week, when we show up to do that work, we can be fully present to it. Most of us, again, I love your language of reset moment. Most of us don't take purposeful pauses to do that work. And then we miss out on the opportunity for our future self to experience that freedom. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've been enjoying this conversation. I just looked up and I was like, oh, we're tight with time here. So anything that I didn't ask you that you wanted to make sure that you got across to the group? I just want to reinforce for us to look at our, at our relationship with time as a set of habits that we lean into. James Clear talks about, we fall to the level of our systems. We don't rise to the level of our goals. If you are white knuckling your way through life, I think that is ultimately detrimental for you. And I think you're going to fail. I think if you have a set of habits, you can lean into recursive reset moments. You come back to a reset moment every Friday, plan for your future self. I think you create infinite emergent opportunity for you on a go forward basis. If you can really lean into that habit. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing. How do people get a hold of you and hear more about what you're doing with leaders and helping them be their time boss for their future self? Yeah, absolutely. We've got a masterclass available. It's a 90 minute overview of the full time <clears throat> boss model. If someone's a self implementer, it's a great way to get connected. They go to the website timeboss.us forward slash masterclass. They can grab that. Also, LinkedIn is a great place to connect. LinkedIn is really just one degree course corrects every day. It's just a tiny little insight someone can take and apply to their world every single day. So LinkedIn is a great place to connect as well. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here, Andrew. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Penny. Great to be here. And thank you all for being here. You can be your own time boss. I love this concept of treating others and treating yourself the way that you would treat others and really thinking more purposefully about your future self and managing your time in that way. So here you have it, recursive reset moments. Like I talk about the reset moments that build as part of a feedback loop to help you create a reset mindset. That's what we're talking about here. A time boss has a reset mindset, enabling you to have that agility that you need in today's changing environment and in your own changing priorities from day to day, from week to week. So go check out the masterclass that Andrew's offering and see how you can be a better time boss for yourself. My name is Penny Zanker, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Today's topic is another opportunity for you to put the knowledge you learned into practice. Tune in again next week for more strategies that will help you have more energy and focus to get more done in less time so you can continue to take back time.